Hello everybody, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and today we are checking out Meshroom, a free and open source photogrammetry software. Now if you're wondering, I have just screwed up saying that over and over and over again, so I instead went with the pronounced video off of YouTube. Uh, but photogrammetry, we'll go with that. Uh, what it basically works is it recreates a 3D scene by using a whole bunch of different pictures from different camera angles. So basically, you take a shot of something from many different angles, and then this software basically recreates it in three dimensions. Now this is nothing new. What's new here is this is uh, an implementation of Alice Vision's uh, 3D Vision Library, uh, and the fact that this is completely free and open source. So you can head on over to this website. I'll throw this link down below, as I always do. And what you're interested in is Meshroom. Now, it is available for Windows and Linux in binary format. Now, it's open source, so you can probably port it to, to Mac if you wish. But uh, today, the uh, Linux users get to look down on the Mac users for uh, their binary support here. So unfortunately, there is no Mac build out of the box. So let's start at the end, and then we'll move back from there. And I'm doing so because this is a very CPU, GPU intensive task. So I've actually already finished one. And then I will kind of go back to the at the beginning and show you how this scene was calculated. The scene took about 20 minutes on my computer to calculate. And there's another important thing to be aware of. You need to have a CUDA compatible GPU. So that means that AMD folk are kind of out of luck, which is probably why there isn't a Mac port now that I think about it. NVIDIA and Mac don't really go together that well. So... Anyways, you need to have that CUDA GPU. I don't think there's even a test in to tell you. I mostly know that from reading the forums from a bunch of AMD users that are like, this thing doesn't work. It just crashes midway. Well, that's ultimately why. So here exactly is the process you're working through. And it kind of goes one, two, three in a way. What you do is you bring in your images. And what I've done is I've used a uh, data set that I found online that is guaranteed to work. Now, I actually found that by far and away, the most annoying process here is acquiring the data, those photos. And I'll come back to that in a bit with some tips and techniques that I picked up. There is no documentation on this guy, nothing. So you're kind of on your own. Now, fortunately, the default settings mostly get it done if you can acquire good raw images to work from. And I will link to these ones that were provided online. It's a good way to actually just make sure the software works for you. And then you can go from there to make sure everything else is working fine. So what you do is basically just come in here and bring in a giant collection of images of the same thing from multiple different directions. In this case, we have 50 pictures of a rock. You basically just drop them in the scene. You can preview them by selecting them here. And what you want to do is you want to come in and make sure that, first off, that the item is entirely in frame. And second, that it's not blurred or distorted or anything along those lines, because that will really screw up the process. And one bad image can just destroy the rest of it. Now, as part of the process, it's going to scan through all of your images anyways, and it will mark the good ones with a check mark. If you've got images that don't have this check mark, there's something wrong with them. It's a good way to learn from doing so. But what you want to do is provide, from the, what it sounds like, you want to have about four or five megapixels or larger images, and you want to have at least 20 or 30 of them. Generally, more is better, although more is also slower. Now, when you come in the first time, you're going to find that you've got this um, node-based workflow down at the bottom here, and it is daunting and terrifying. So you see, you've got all the various different steps that go through. And I'll come back to this when I recreate the scene in a second. But what... I can tell you confidently right now is you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. The, the defaults will work for 99% of people. Another thing to be aware of is this GUI is actually completely optional. There is instruction out there for doing this entirely from a command line or terminal. So if you're doing this as part of your own workflow, you can automate this entire process and not have to come in here at all. Just something to be aware of. So once you've got all your images in and you've got them all kind of looking good, uh, you click start. Oh, actually, you click save, save it to a location, and then click start. And once you've done that, it will turn off for, well, it depends on your scene. I, I've had it go a couple of hours. I've had it go, like in this case of this rock, about 20 minutes. And then at the end of it, you will end up with something like this. And this is the mesh and point cloud used to generate it. Now, we can turn off everything but the mesh and see the end result. So you see you got various different options. So those are... Let's get rid of the mesh. It basically creates this. So each one of these icons right here, those are the cameras or the, the, the point of reference from each photograph that it was detected. And you can see them in 3D space. I'm rotating or orbiting using the left mouse button, and you can pan using the middle mouse button. But you can see where all of the different perspectives came together to go and get and create this point cloud that we're going to use right here. And then the ultimate end result of the point cloud is this mesh that it generates. And each one of these steps, as you see, we go through this process 
So middle mouse button pans through, uh, scroll mouse button zooms in, by the way. But each one of these steps ultimately results in a folder somewhere. In my case, a folder called temp and then rock. So here you see we've got rock, mushroom cache, and then each step is broken down. So your camera connection, your camera init, and each one is has all the generated files in it. And most of the times these are pretty open source files or standardized files. So you see, got the logs of everything that we did here, but it's creating uh, EXR depth maps. So that's a standard uh, photo format. We can open up and see the results generated at that step. It also caches them so that if you go through the process again, but you just added a couple of more photos, it doesn't have to do it for all of the last photos that it worked with. So you can add more detail and not have to calculate quite as much. And then the end result is this guy. So here is your mesh. It was generated at this point. Open this guy up. You'll see it created an object file. But we move further on. This one is an object file and a texture map. So you see it's created a textured object for us and the material file to go with that. Now, OBJ format is waveform object format. It's a, a pretty much universal static 3D mesh format. So just about every single 3D application under the sun is going to support it, including, of course, Blender. But keep in mind, these are dense meshes. There is a lot going on there. So I'll go ahead and open up that file. So that was my D drive, temp, rock, meshroom cache, texturing, some GUID, and then the object file. And let this spin away. And one thing you might want to have done is flipped the up axis right here before you did your import because the up axis that this generates is always different from what we're ultimately working with. So you see we're actually kind of upside down. So I'm just going to do an R X axis 90 degrees, R X axis 90 degrees, and then press enter. Okay, let me undo that. R X axis 90 degrees. All right. So let's turn texturing on and locate our rock. There you go. So there is our rock in the world. Now, obviously, you're going to have to do some deletion to get rid of everything else. But at this point, you're dealing with a very well-textured polygon object. Here, let me switch over here into uh, walking navigation. And you get an idea of what we got. So you got all your background that we're going to have to trim out later. But we very much have a very, very dense, high-definition Texture mapped rock. Now there's no normal maps or anything like that. You're gonna to wanna to use a tool like the one I showed you the other day for creating uh, maps uh, from it. But as you can see, you get a real high density and it creates the 3D texture for you. And at this point in time, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and strip out all the background material so you have just your one object. And then, ooh, I don't know what that was, but uh, if I'm gonna switch over here into, so select my object, switch into, edit mode, and there you have an idea of just how many meshes we're dealing with. So this is uh, 300,000 faces on this particular object. So you're gonna wanna strip that down, and I'm gonna show you how in just a second. But the cool thing here is you, you can create or scan just about any kind of real world object, and it's gonna create you this very cool polygonal mesh. And if you give it more and more information, it's going to do a better result. Now, one way you can go ahead and cut that polygon count down quite a bit is we can go into this object and apply a decimate modifier to it. But that's not actually how I'm going to go about doing it. That would, you know, basically cut down the number of triangles in the scene, but it does it in kind of a brutal way. So there is another tool I'm going to introduce in this video as well. So anyways, that was Simply Mesh in action. You can see the end result out of it. And I think you can see how you can um, really bring in some really cool real world tools. Even if you're just going to come in, um, take that model, use it to bake a normal map. So a high resolution normal map, and then take the texture map they've generated. And then you could just use a retopo on it and create a low polygon version from that, it's still very useful for a real-time workflow, even if it's scanned from real-world items. And I've even seen some examples of where people have used this on like back alleys and recreated a 3D scene in their computer. You can get some really cool results from this. So now I do want to mention, Meshroom is not alone in any regard in this space. I think the most popular ones, and I, I don't work particularly in this space, so don't quote me on this, but this is from my own research, seems to be uh, Zephyr and Reality Capture. Those seem to be the two that have the, the largest user bases anyways. And what you'll notice here is it's $4,200 or 1,500 euro. Uh, this guy is available on Steam on a monthly basis as well, by the way, Reality Capture is. But you can 
obviously see where the value in Meshroom comes in. My understanding is by, comport, by performance comparisons, it's a fair bit slower right now than the commercial alternatives, but it's completely free, it's completely open source, and it's doing some really good results. It's fairly young right now, so there's not a lot of tutorial information or documentation of any kind whatsoever. You're kind of on your own. But it's still a powerful tool that you should definitely consider adding to your arsenal. Now, I do want to get back to a second. I grabbed the rocks from this post right here. Uh, so if you want to grab them, it is in this link. I will toss this link down below to this guy. But thank you to MK Brewer for the uh, the models there. They worked out very consistently. And I also kind of want to come back to that point as well. I had some horrific nightmare scenarios come out. This is my living room couch, by the way. If you look at this really closely, there's also my exercise bike is right there. Uh, that is... Um, a steamer floor cleaning vacuum. Uh, I think this is another chair. And you can see if the data isn't ideal, the result can be a little terrifying. And I actually came up with some results that were so much worse as a real, uh, in reality, to be honest. First off, I found it does not like picture, pictures taken using my Pixel phone. Um, and if you look at the Pixel phone versus other um, images when you download them. See if I still have my rock images right here. So these came in, this this is what you get when you extract his archive. Go into the properties in Windows and you'll see that they were created using, so they're not even that high resolution. These are 1024 by 1536. And I was sending it images like 4K by 3K-ish kind of thing from my pixel. But you'll notice here, it's created using a Canon and this f-stop and exposure time compared to what you'll see if you take a picture with your cell phone, it's like an order of magnitude like 50 fold so i don't know if there's something in a canon's uh, picture versus a cell phone's picture that it, it just doesn't like working with but i never got good results from my cell phone period when i switched to my dslr camera i got much better results but again the lens really mattered um i was using a macro lens and that was terrible as well so you kind of want to have like a standard i think uh, well, there, there's tutorials on the, the process out there for what, you know, your ideal f-stop and aperture and all that stuff are, and they're important. So really, if you've got access to a real honest-to-goodness camera as opposed to a smartphone, you will probably get much better results. And another thing to keep in mind, and this is an area I really screwed up when it came to making my photos or taking my photos, is I... Um, I took a blue screen approach. So I wanted to um, narrow down to just my object. So I put it on a white background and that gave horrible results. It, it actually, I so I did a coffee cup, a 360 view of a coffee cup, and it actually inverted it so that the, the coffee logo and texture were inside out and backwards. And I think this came down to trying to isolate out my background. So it needs these markers. It needs these things in the background. You do not want to blue screen or white screen this at all. Trust me. You want to have identifiable markers in the background so it can extrapolate the position from it. So don't try to do anything special for narrowing down your um, your shooting area. Don't try to make it as plain as possible. If anything, do the exact opposite. Put a recognizable pattern underneath it so that the software can better do a job. And this kind of stuff, it was painful to learn because quite frankly, each time you got it wrong, it was like an hour's work just thrown away on your computer. So um, the process is kind of slow, but I would highly recommend when you start doing this, uh, start the process up and wait till it starts creating the uh, the point cloud like what you'll see here. So even when it's just starting out, this will start showing up. And then what you want to do is come in here and see where your cameras are orientated because every time mine screwed up, all of the cameras were kind of wonky in their positioning. If you did a 360 view and it doesn't look like you captured it 360, your end result is going to be crap. Now you don't need to take a 360 view by the way, you're not going to get back imaging on it, but you want to make sure that the virtual positions of the camera that it's pulling in 3D view kind of match where you physically were when you took the pictures. Otherwise, just cancel your render. It's not going to look good. And this is one of those things that I trust. Trust me, I learned through trial and error and getting this stuff to work. Getting the software to work is brutally simple. Getting the pictures to work right is a gigantic pain in the butt. So first off, my recommendation is grab this rock data set. It's a good size. Uh, it doesn't give the cleanest results you've ever seen. This can all be erased. Not a biggie there. But what it does is it works and it's reproducible. So start there and then start bringing in your own images. And when you start with your own images, try and start at like 
15 or 20, do a preliminary render, see how this stuff turned out, if the cameras look set up right, and then start adding a whole lot more images to the mix before you do a full-blown render or burn. Trust me, you will save all kinds of time if you do that. Now, finally, I talked about this a couple times, when you are done, um, you're gonna have a really dense mesh. And if you're looking to use it, even if you're just trying to use it to, to work with for retopo or whatever, if you don't have a beefy computer, you're going to probably want to cut it down to a certain degree anyways. And for that, I highly recommend Instant Meshes. Now, Instant Meshes is another free application. It should be in your toolbox anyways. Um, and I've done a video on it, as you can see here. Uh, that's the end result, I believe. What it allows you to do is basically bring in a mesh and then simplify it. And the cool thing here is you simplify it into quads. So if you can bring in a highly tessellated mesh, you can say, okay, now make this into, um, so here's the, the profile lines that it detects, and then it will quadrilate it. And when you're working with quads, you can get much nicer um, simplification or subdivisions or uh, your retopo lines are good. You basically just want to work with quads when you can. So you can really cut down the number of polygons using Instant Mesh, and then you can just export it out as object again. So you don't even really, actually, no, you're probably going to want it workflow-wise, scan it, bring it into Blender, trim off the excess fat, so just you know keep what you want, and then uh, export that again as an OBJ file into Instant Mesh, reduce it down, direct export that output as, again as an object file, and then you're ready to start using that in your game or movie or whatever you happen to be working on. But that is the workflow I personally recommend. You could also, again, use the decimate modifier in Blender, but your results aren't going to be as nice. And I will toss the link to this video as well. It is a great application. Uh, I did this pretty early in the channel. I did this back in November of 2015, and I'll probably do a refresh on it because Instant Meshes is an absolutely awesome program that should be in your arsenal if you're a 3D developer if you're not already using it. Okay, so let's just finish things up quickly and I will show you the workflow or the process here. So I'm just gonna close this out so that my computer isn't in complete conniption mode. The fans in the background are spinning and spinning and spinning. So what you're gonna do is basically download the zip file like this into your zips folder. What you want is meshroom, extract that guy out, go inside and then load meshroom.exe. This will obviously bring us to the interface we saw just a second ago. It's all written in Python, by the way. What's cool about that is potentially it could be embedded directly inside of Blender. But here you see, over here it says drop images, files, folders, and now you can. Uh, basically all you do is go to wherever your images are. So they're also in my downloads folder. So I downloaded the rocks. I will throw that link down below if you want to start with the test. I basically, you could have brought in the whole folder, but I'm just going to go ahead and grab these guys, tap back to instant message, me, eh, uh, sorry, mesh room. I'm mixing my applications up now and drop them in. And now you'll see across the bottom, you have all your various different settings. The camera initialization, there are things you configure. So there are 50 viewports it's detected. You can go ahead and change details of them. Nice thing is you really don't have to. The good news, and that's good news because this stuff is confusing. Next up, we go to feature extraction, image matching. Again, there's all kinds of settings for each one of these, but for the most part, you're not gonna touch any of these things unless like this is your job. For most people, you can just come in, do that, click up here, Go save as, pick a location, pick a name. Everyone knows what the rock is cooking. So select that, uh, cooking. All right, so you're gonna wanna do that. Otherwise, when you press start, it's gonna prompt you to do that anyway. So save in advance. What you're gonna find is it just, it rushes through all of this stuff until it comes to creating the depth map. This is where the pig is in terms of timing. You'll notice there are options here for downscaling. Uh, you could definitely, that is probably one of the options you might want to play with. Uh, another one that's kind of interesting is your meshing here has an output. So you'll see here when you generate your texture, you can set your texture size. So 8192. So if you're working with a real time as well, what I can do is I can right click here and say new texturing. So create a new texturing node like this and I could drop in here to here. So now I have feedback going on and I could say, okay, 1024 by 1024. And now when I render this, what this will ultimately do is this node will do exactly like it did before and it'll create an 8K texture version, but it will also create a 1K texture version. So if you want something that um, is usable in games, for example, or say you wanted something that was a TIFF, 
or EXR or however you want to do things. You want to have a different unwrapping method. Um, that is how this node-based hierarchy can work. So you can actually create uh, multiple different, so here's your meshing options. You can also create like a lower mesh version. So I could drop this out right here, drag this into another mesh, so create a meshing node. And we could also have it create a um, lower polygon version, so maximum points. We could drop that way down and then we create a lower density mesh. Now you're gonna get lower quality as a result and you're probably better off using a tool like Instant Meshes for doing the tweak anyways. But you see how you can use this node-based hierarchy to create different iterations and versions. There's also, as you'll notice, we're going through here. So there's depth filter, meshing, mesh filtering, texturing. Well, if you notice, if I click here, we've got things like mesh decimation. So what I could actually do is take the output from our meshing here into this decimation node and then our input there into, so we'll break that input off. Come on, go away. Oop, that's not what I wanted. Uh, by the way, there's full undo support, thankfully. But anyways, what you want to want to do is say drag this guy into there once you figure out how to unhook that. Not really sure. Uh, but once that's dragged in there, then you can use the mesh decimation to do the simplification for you. So the min vertices, max vertices, or whatever. So you can build these nodes together to create the hierarchy however you want it to be, or you can have parallel workflows, etc. It's a very, uh, very cool system. And texturing is going to make sense. The options here are going to make sense for a game developer. Meshing will make sense. You saw mesh uh, decimation for sure. Denoising makes sense to people. Where it starts getting really confusing is pretty much everything in this section right there. And in that case, I would just leave it alone. And if you leave it alone, you get pretty good results. And then what you want to do is just go ahead and click start and it will start going through. You'll notice there is a progress bar at the top there. It is showing how far along in the process it is. So you see right now, this is done, and we are now into feature extraction, for example. And there's a progress bar within feature extraction. And then once that is done, we will progress up here, and it will move into image matching, and then so on and so forth. Any one of these things, by the way, you can click and go into logs and see what is up. So if an error occurs, it will show red up here. So we've already gone through image matching, and now we are in feature matching, and it just kind of keeps going. But if you hit a red, that means an error occurred, an error of some form occurred, and in that case, you... Uh, um, well, you need to fix it. And trying to figure out why exactly it went wrong, that can be a little tricky. Go to the node in question, hit the log, and take a look at it. But I give you no guarantees that you're going to make sense of why the error happened. A lot of times it will be, it really did not like one of your source images. And there is the other thing to keep in mind. I think it will show up once this step is done. Um, not sure. So you see also you could get further progress in the log which is kind of cool. So you see we're at 100% uh, of that particular task right now, I think. So log and keep going or are we done? No, that is a very strange 100%. All right, so that particular task is done. It moves on, keeps logging. And on it goes. Now this part is very, 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 very slow. Uh, especially, well, well, we mostly blip through these things. Again, it's once you get to the depth math that everything is going to just come to a screeching halt. I found the rest of this stuff took about, I don't know, four minutes, five minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'll do a quick pause and I'll be right back. Okay, so we've progressed along. We've actually got through this camera connection, and that is the important one I was talking about earlier. So now we see we're in depth map, and we're going to be here for a while. So this is where I'm going to ultimately end the video. But the key thing is this camera connection has now ended. The end result of this should be pretty much exactly the same as what I demonstrated earlier, but now you, what you'll start to see is your scene is coming together. And the most important part, again, see how all those cameras are like arranged in full 3D space. There's not a weird, they're not in a half moon. You can see a bit of a uh, preview of what the end result is going to be. This is the point where you want to check in and cancel things if you have to. Because this point in time is one-fifth of the time or one-tenth of the time needed. This point of time from about here to here is 90% of the time. So if things don't look right here, if the positioning doesn't look right here, by the way, you can control an orbit using these guys as well. And then scale is strange. Scale is a zoom. But um, what you'll find is if you're not right at this point in time, you're never going to be right. The other thing you will find is that your computer is completely unresponsive while it's doing all these calculations. So panning around in this view isn't the funnest thing in the world. But that is 
it. I I have to say, um, Meshroom is is an awesome looking program. It's it's amazing that this stuff is out there free and open source. And this is built on open algorithms that have been out there for a while. It's these people that are making their work available free is what's making our lives better and better and better. It's awesome to see this kind of stuff available, and it's an awesome program to work with. I. I I definitely recommend you check it out. Now, again, the source of frustration you're going to find, well, as long as you have a CUDA GPU, because that's going to be frustrating <laughs> no matter how you look at it. But beyond that, it's all in how you took the images. If your images are failing, take a look at your background. Make sure you are not on a neutral uh, or devoid background. That seems to be the biggest problem. Make sure that you don't have blurred images. Um, and then I would highly recommend trying not to use a phone, at least a Pixel phone. There's just something about it. The results just didn't work for crap. But the minute I switched over to an actual real camera, my results became so much better. I would recommend to get things up and going. Download the Rock Mesh. You know what the end result is should be because of this video. If it doesn't happen, you either have an incompatibility with your computer or there's something currently wrong with the current build of Meshroom, but it's a great place to start. So start with that rock render. It doesn't take too, too long. If it's taking much over 20 minutes or a half an hour, there's something wrong, unless you're on a prehistoric machine. But even then, if it's more than an hour or two, there is definitely something wrong. But keep in mind, once you start getting into really high resolution images and a whole bunch of them, this process could potentially take hours. So you're going to want to test for the data set that you know works to start. And then if your own results don't work by this phase, as I mentioned, you've got an issue and start over. Also make sure that you check through here that there are green checks beside all of your images. And if there is no green check, use that particular image as an example of what it doesn't like in your images. All right. So that is it. It. I hope you guys found Meshroom interesting. There's a lot of opportunities here. Like I could really see you. And one thing I really kind of want to try is making a game model using clay. I, there's just something about that. I wouldn't mind doing like a claymation on a turntable that was rendered into a 3D point cloud. I, I think that could be a really cool workflow. And especially if you're more of an analog artist as opposed to a digital artist, this kind of gives you a route to go. Really, all you need to go to really know to get this stuff working is how to um, clean up a mesh in Blender. And I can teach you that if you really want to know. It's not a hard process. But you don't really need to know that much about modeling or topography or anything. You will eventually for animating. But it. it can get you a lot of the way there, whereas you may not have modeling skill. The other big thing is even if you do have modeling skills, this is a great way to get real world things into your computer textured in a way that looks good that you can then retopple them to a more real time friendly model. Or you can use it for scanning buildings or historical archives. And then of course, there's the non game dev applications of stuff like this as well. Uh, crime scene recreations, historical preservation, uh, movie sets, that kind of stuff. That's true traditionally what, um, I'm not even going to try to say the word again, but what this kind of technology is all about. So hopefully you guys found that useful. If you have any questions, I'm probably not going to be able to answer them because the specifics, it gets tricky. A lot of it is kind of undocumented and you're kind of on your own. You're, you're blending a lot of technologies together. You're blending the skill of photography and photo, whatever the hell it is, together. And there's a unique learning curve in the middle. The one thing that I would keep in mind is that default component workflow in Meshroom should serve you well. So start from there before you start playing with different nodes and combinations. All right. Hope you guys found that useful. Hope you found Meshroom as interesting as I did, and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.